for such a lucid presentation and uh, explaining it so beautifully around the cases we you discussed. I believe there are no queries in the chat box. So thank you so much, sir, once again. And with that, we come to our next speaker. I hope everybody is familiar with her, uh, Dr. Arisha Alam, the the more the young the young faculty of our department. She'll be talking about autoimmune hemolytic anemia. I welcome you, Dr. Arisha. Thank you, ma'am. Are my slides visible, ma'am? Yes. Yes, it is. So today I'm going to talk about autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So the contents of my talk shall include introduction about this entity, the epidemiology, classification and its main three subtypes, that is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, cold agglutinin disease, and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. And in these individual three types, I'm going to talk about their pathogenesis, their clinical manifestations, how to diagnose them, what's the immunological basis of this diagnosis, the treatment modalities, prognosis, and if time permits, a small case. So talking about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it is an acquired form of hemolytic anemia. So it is defined, the definition is very simple, any hemolytic anemia with a positive direct anti-globulin test is considered as a, a, a autoimmune hemolytic anemia along with exclusion of other alternative diagnosis. So this is an extrinsic defect, unlike the hereditary hemolytic anemias like the hereditary spherocytosis, the enzyme deficiency, which we commonly study. This is an extrinsic defect because the antibodies are acting against the normal RBCs. However, there is one exception which I'll be talking on later on. Most of the cases of this uh, disorder are associated with some underlying problem like lymphoproliferative disease or a collagen vascular disease. The type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it is defined by the thermal ability of the antibody to fix the complement and its site of RBC destruction. Mm -hmm. So what happens? The common mechanism is that the antibodies that target the RBC surface antigen leading to the premature cell lysis. Now, because of this ongoing hemolysis, the body tries to compensate. There is increased erythropoietin, increased RBC production. But whenever this compensatory response is insufficient to redress the normal hemoglobin blood levels, the patient lands up in anemia. The epidemiology of this disease is about the prevalence seen in the adult literature is 17 per 1 lakh population is affected by this disease. So we can extrapolate this data. That means at a time about 1.3 million people are affected across the globe. The overall annual incidence is reported to, uh, reported to be around 1 to 3 cases per 1 lakh per year. However, in children, this presentation is relatively rare. The incidence is only 0.8 per 1 lakh individuals. The mean age of diagnosis is quite early. We can pick it up by 10 months over the range up to four years. Now in children, it is more common in boys, whereas in teenagers, it is commoner in girls. Now, as we have talked about the main three types, out of those three, warm type is very much common and it is responsible for more than 50% of these cases. What are the proportion of these different subtypes? The warm is responsible in about 60 to 70% of the cases. The cold agglutinin disease is responsible in 20 to 25% of cases. The paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria is seen in about 6 to 12% of cases. However, in about small subset of less than 5%, we can have mixed type also. So how do we define the types of autoimmune hemolytic anemia? They can be classified either on the basis of pathogenesis or they can be classified on the basis of the antibodies. So by pathogenesis, they can be primary where there is no underlying condition. So this is seen in about 37% of cases. And secondary, when this is a part of a more complex disease, 
This is seen in about 63% of cases. Now, what are these other complex diseases? The most common ones are systemic autoimmune disease like SLE or a malignancy, immunodeficiency syndromes, Evans syndrome, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. Infections are also quite common like mycoplasma and other viruses. And sometimes it can be drug induced. So the, among all these secondary causes, the most common ones are number one, infections, second, autoimmune diseases, third, immunodeficiency syndromes. Now, this was a study of about uh, over a span of 12 years, a retrospective analysis done by the Gangaram Hospital. Over there, the secondary autoimmune cases were in a lesser proportion as compared to the Western literature. They found in about 40% of cases. However, the common etiologies were the same, infection, autoimmune diseases, Evan syndrome and childhood malignancies like Hodgkin lymphoma and BALL. The immunodeficiency syndromes were seen in only 4% of cases like common variable immunodeficiency and viscot aldrich syndrome. Now, what the second type through which we can classify this autoimmune hemolytic anemia, that is on the basis of antibodies. So on this basis, it is the three main types which I have already discussed, the warm type, the cold agglutinin type, the paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. The warm one is the most common. Now, this is the most important slide because this is going to help you understand the pathogenesis, the treatment modalities, the laboratory investigations, positivities. So number one, talking about warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Here, the antibody responsible is IgG type. That is a main antibody. It functions at a higher, warmer temperature. That is about 37 degrees Celsius and it reacts against the RH antigen, which is present in most of the RBCs of our population. The second is the cold agglutinin syndrome, which is mediated by the IgM type of antibody. Now, this antibody functions at a colder temperature, that is 4 degrees Celsius, and it reacts against the I antigen of the RBC membrane. The third is the PCH. This is also mediated by IgG, but this is different from the warm type because this is biphasic. In the warm type, the IgG attaches to the RBC at 37 degrees Celsius. But in the PCH, the IgG, it attaches to the RBCs and fixes the complement at 4 degrees Celsius. That means at colder temperature. However, it requires higher temperature there, thereafter to further amplify the complement cascade and to cause the lysis. So this is very important to understand the difference between these two IgGs. Now, this PCH IgG, it works against the P antigen. It is also called the donat Lansteiner antibody. Now, the mix, there is another entity that is a mixed type which contains both the warm IgG and the cold IgM. Now, we are going to talk about these three main subtypes in brief. So, number one is a warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. What is the pathophysiology? As we all know that it is IgG, warm type antibody, it binds to the RBC at 37 degrees Celsius. And thereafter, when these RBCs, which are coated with, uh, which are coated with these antibodies, reach the spleen, they are identified by the FC gamma receptors present on the macrophages. Now, these FC gamma receptors, they attach these RBCs, and now they are destroyed either through phagocytosis or fragmentation or cytotoxicity. Now, this is the main modality of destruction or immune clearance of these coated RBCs in warm hemolytic anemia. So this is extravascular hemolysis. As a result, you get splenomegaly in these cases. Now, some of these RBCs also fix the complement on their surface and lead to the formation of C3B. Now, these C3B coated RBCs, they are identified by the liver macrophages and destroyed. In a very small proportion, this complement activation may continue till the end leading to the formation of membrane attack complex and intravascular hemolysis. So the take home from this is that the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias commonly are mediated by extravascular hemolysis. Now the etiology is same. It can be idiopathic or the primary in more than 50% cases and secondary. The secondary causes are the same as I've already talked about, the immunodeficiencies, the infections, and the autoimmune. A special mention about Evan syndrome. It, it is responsible for about 30% of pediatric autoimmune hemolytic anemias. So what is Evan syndrome? It is a concurrent presence of two, at least two immune cytopenias. 
Now, a study was done to look at the genetic basis of Evans, and it was found that 65% of patients had genetic involvement in the genes which were uh, responsible for the pathogenesis of immunodeficiencies. Therefore, this is highly recommended that all children who present with Evans syndrome, they should be screened for the lymphoproliferative syndromes, the immunodeficiencies like CDID and HIV. Now, multi-lineage autoimmune cytopenias can often be the single initial sign of SLE. Therefore, you have to follow up these patients and do regular re-examinations. Now, coming to the clinical features of the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It can have a variable degree of severity. In some cases, it can have an acute presentation, a life-threatening one, when it is a fast progressive, uh, fastly progressive anemia. However, in majority of the cases, it is well compensated and CHF or any kind of circulatory collapse is very rare. So whenever a patient comes to you with hemolytic anemia, a fir the first question you should have in your mind is that I should rule out immune mediated cause as well. The common symptoms are related to anemia, like paleness of skin, fatigue, confusion, lightheadedness, dizziness, exercise intolerance, and fever due to hypermetabolic state. The less common causes are yellowing of the skin and sclera, enlarged spleen liver, and the chronic cases may develop cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. If the child has a secondary disease, so the uh, features of the underlying disorder will also be present. A, a very important thing to mention is that this child who is presenting with anemia should not be having any physical stigmata of the congenital bone marrow failure syndromes. Because if such is present, then your diagnosis becomes different. Now, the same, Gangaram uh, the same study at the uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, they found that pallor, fever, and jaundice were the more, most common features. And hepatomegaly was common in Indian children as compared to splenomegaly. Now, whenever a child has certain atypical manifestations like lymphadenopathy, persistent fever, hypertension, renal failure, rash, or any echimosis, we should always rule out any underlying malignancy or collagen vascular disease. Now, while taking history, it's important to take history about the recent medications because certain drugs like cephalosporins and piperacillin, they can lead to autoimmune hemolytic anemia of warm type. We should take history of the systemic autoimmune diseases, inflammatory disorders, and malignancies. Family history is not uh, very significant. It's usually absent, but in certain cases like SLE, it may be present. Now coming to the diagnosis of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. What is the diagnostic criteria? It is you should have a laboratory or clinical evidence of hemolysis along with the serological evidence. So what is the serological evidence? It is a positive direct antiglobulin test, which was previously called the Coombs test. This positivity may be for IgG or for, I, or for C3D, that is a complement, or for both. Now, because IgG, they are high, high affinity for antigens, so they remain attached to the RBC membranes. Therefore, the detection in that is very much, uh, it's high, likely to be successful. Any child presenting with anemia, your first level of investigations remains the same. Number one, automated counts, peripheral smear, reticulocyte count, direct antiglobulin test, the other indices of hemolysis, and urine analysis. So let's see what findings we may find in a child who is having warm type of immune, uh, immune hemolytic anemia. The automated counts may show anemia. WBC count may have neutrophilia. Mostly the platelet counts are within normal limits. But if you have a thrombocytopenia, you should suspect other etiologies as well, like bone marrow failure, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, or Evans syndrome. In Evans syndrome, you may have all the three cell lines decrease. The RBC indices are not very helpful. Looking at the peripheral smear, the classical sign or the classical feature on the peripheral smear is the microspherocytes. Here, as you can see, these RBCs, they are, in small, they are smaller in size compared to the small lymphocytes. They are very sphere-like and the central pallor is uh, nearly lost. So these are numerous microspherocytes. Apart from this, you can have polytomasia, nucleated RBCs, and schistocytes. Now talking about reticulocyte, we expect that it is going to be typically high, but in a significant proportion, like about 40% of children, you may have initial reticulocytopenia. Now, why is this 
uh, a presentation, it is because now these antibodies may be acting against the erythroid precursors in the bone marrow itself. Mm -hmm. They may be apoptosis of the bone marrow erythroblast, or they can be a concomitant viral infection like Parvo B19. So therefore, this, the take home from this slide is that if the child presents with reticulocytopenia, you should not just completely rule out the possibility of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The other indices of hemolysis include increased indirect bilirubin, increased LDH, decreased haptoglobin. The study at Gangaram, they found that majority of their patients were having the hemoglobin in the range of three to six gram per deciliter, which is nearly severe anemia. About 12%, they had very severe anemia that is less than three gram per deciliter. And only 2% of the population had more than nine gram per deciliter of hemoglobin. Their, their cohort had reticulocytopenia in 26% of cases. So this is a good number. And when they went ahead with that, it was positive in about 94% of cases. So this just highlights that the absence of reticulocytosis should not rule out your autoimmune hemolytic anemia, despite it being a very important marker of hemolysis. Now the next test, which is the most important, is the direct antiglobulin test. In the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, this is going to be positive for IgG because we have seen in the pathophysiology, the RBCs are coated with the IgG or C3B because sometimes they fix the complement also and it can be positive for both of them. Now, there are certain scenarios when they are, it is not positive for IgG. Then what you should do? Then you should suspect coal agglutinin disease and go ahead with the coal agglutinin titer when it is positive for C3 only and not for IgG. In second scenario, you should also test for the donat Lansteiner antibody if you have intravascular hemolysis present in the child. The other tests which are important are the blood group and screening, the liver function test because of the high, so although a rare association with giants and hepatitis and a common association with viral hepatotropic infections. And a baseline kidney function test should be done so that in future when you give immunosuppressive agents, you can monitor this kidney function. Now, talking about the immunohematological diagnosis, the gold standard of diagnosis is your direct antiglobulin test. So what is the principle of this test? The test tries to identify the, pre the presence of IgG, the, the immunoglobulins, or the complement factors on the surface of the RBC. So how is it done? You take the, uh, the, uh, the blood which is collected from the patient. The RBCs are separated. They are washed at room temperature. And to these RBCs, a Coombs agent is added. So what is this Coombs, Coombs agent? It is a polyspecific sera which contains anti-human anti antibodies against IgG also and against C3 also. So that's why it's a polyspecific sera. So once it, once it is added to an affected patient's RBC, these anti-human immunoglobulins, they bind to the immunoglobulins coated on the RBC surface. They bind to the complement factors coated on the RBC surfaces. And they cause linking of these RBCs together and it, you can see it in the form of agglutination. So agglutination is a sign of the positive Coombs test. So once you see agglutination, you, you can be very sure that this is immune mediated, but you are not clear whether it is positive for IgG or for C3. So then you go to the next step, that is you do a monospecific uh, anti-serum, one with anti-IgG and the other with anti-C3 to be very sure that what of the two are present. Now, despite of all your efforts, in 10% of cases, the DAT may be negative. This can happen because you, uh, the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, although it is basically mediated by IgG, in some very... Am I audible, ma'am? Uh, yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you. So in certain scenarios, it can be mediated by IgA type of antibodies. And second possibility can be that these IgG molecules... 
uh, actually there is a problem uh, yeah just connecting again there was a electricity cut Uh, we are so sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, she is just joining in a while. Yeah, there was a power cut in there. Uh, Arisha, you can uh, share your presentation with me and I can try projecting. I'm, I'm just sharing. Okay. You can mail it to me. Ma'am, is my presentation visible now? Yes, it is. Okay. So, uh, we were talking about the direct anti-globulin test. So, in certain scenarios, about 10%, it is negative because the mediation is through the rare antibody that is IgA or if your uh, IgG immunoglobulins have very low affinity. So, when you are washing them in the preparation stages, they may get washed out. So you should advise your hematologist to try with another monospecific anti-IgA sera or try washing the RBCs with a low ionic strength solutions at lower temperatures of 4 degrees Celsius. Now, despite of all these efforts, the DAT may still be negative. That means our, the IgGs are in very small number. Then you need to go ahead with the sensitive test like super cones, that is an enhanced DAT assist or through the flow cytometry. The indirect antiglobulin test that detects the presence of free autoantibodies in the plasma. This is important because it helps to you, helps in cross-matching. So what happens when in the serum you add another donor RBCs, if the antibodies are present, they bind to the RBCs. Now in the next step, you add the Coombs reagent. 
So to these coated RBCs, these immunoglobulins, they bind, they agglutinate. So this shows that this uh, uh, RBC is not compatible with your patient's serum. Now, after the first line test, we come to the second line test. Because we've seen a very high proportion of cases have secondary type of uh, immune disease. So we should go ahead with the screening for primary immune disorders and for the rheumatological diseases. For the immune disorders, we do the immunoglobulin assays, the lymphocytes, subpopulation, the ALPS screening, and for the rheumatological diseases, we test the autoantibodies like ANA and anti-DNA. Now, the child may have another autoimmunity syndrome, so we also test anti-thyroid antibodies. We do the regular screening, oxygen screening, and the serology for the infections. Now, another important question is that whether bone marrow is indicated in all these children. So the answer is no. It is only indicated in atypical conditions. When you have some associated another cytopenia, you have persistent reticulocytopenia, or you have suspicious of malignancy because of the presence of lymphadenopathy and organomegaly, and you have bone marrow failure syndrome. So in this scenario, if you do a bone marrow, you may find maturing erythroid hyperplasia. And the bone marrow is also helpful to rule out underlying lymphoma. Now, what are the differential diagnosis of autoimmune hemolytic anemia? So the number one etiology, the number one differential diagnosis is non-immune hemolytic anemia, like the membrane defects or the enzyme. Okay. Possibility, the very close DD is hereditary spherocytosis, because as we saw that in the peripheral smear, there were so many spherocytes. So how to differentiate in hereditary spherocytosis, the MCHC is going to be very high, more than 36 gram per deciliter. Third possibility is the Wilson's disease. Here you see spherocytosis along with hemolytic picture. Fourth possibility can be myopathic hemolytic anemia. So here the differentiating features are the increased number of schistocytes as compared to the spherocytes. And you also have thrombocytopenia as an added feature. The next possibility can be hypoplastic anemia if the child also has reticulocytopenia. And lastly, parvovirus B19 infection. Now coming to the treatment of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Our goals are to decrease the hemolysis, to stabilize the hemoglobin and to increase the safety for the RBC transfusion. So before going ahead with the treatment, we need to know certain definitions. When do we call complete response, partial response and no response? So complete response is when your hemoglobin has reached the normal limit for age, although on the lower side. And there are no signs of hemolysis. That is, your retic count is normal, your bilirubin is normal. Partial response is when the hemoglobin has increased more than two, equal to a more than 2 gram per deciliter, but has not reached the normal range. And no response is when the rise of hemoglobin is less than 2 gram per deciliter, or there is dependence on the transfusions. The treatment of warm, uh, the warm type of immune, uh, hemolytic anemia depends upon the severity and the rapidity of anemia. If it is a mild disease with hemoglobin ranging from 9 to 12 gram per deciliter, you don't need any treatment. You just need to observe the patient. However, if it is severe, as we saw in the study at Gangaram, majority had severe type of anemia that from 6 to 9 gram per deciliter, there is a rapid fall. Then you have to initiate the treatment. When the child is extremely unstable hemodynamically, that is, he's in CHF, he has pulmonary edema, or when the hemoglobin is less than 5, then you need to go ahead with the blood transfusions. Now, transfusion is very tricky in these patients because, as we all know, the autoantibodies present in the serum react against the donor RBC, and they may also be simultaneous alloantibodies. So, you have to be very cautious, and your uh, pre precautions before transfusion have to be very strict. Now, the indications I've already told you, because of the fear of these complications, you should never withheld the blood transfusion if it is indicated in the child. So if you have uh, choices between the blood available for the patient, you should choose the one which has the least incompatible blood and it is cross-matched with the patient serum. So the purpose of giving this transfusion is that it provides temporary support till your additional therapy slows the rate of hemolysis. So what precautions we need to take? Number one, the patient's blood should be extensively tested for red cell phenotyping. That means apart from the RH and ABO blood groups, minor blood groups should also be matched so that the chances of transfusion reaction decreases. You should use liquid depleted RBCs for transfusion 
and you need to give only uh, a very guarded amount, volume of blood that is about 3 to 5 ml per kg you should give the transfusion at a slow rate maximum time allowed is 4 hours and during transfusion there are chances that child may have transfusion reaction hemoglobinuria so you need to periodically keep checking the urine and plasma for the free hemoglobin and simultaneously the most important step over here is to initiate the steroids immediately on presentation so what is our choice and they have maximum efficacy IVIG and plasma exchange may be used, but they do not have much uh, benefit over uh, in this disease. The second line is rituximab and splenectomy. The third line are the immunosuppressive agents. And the refractory cases, we go ahead with Campath 1H, which is an antibody against T cell, autologous stem cell transplantation, and high dose cyclophosphamide. Always add folic acid and vitamin B12 to the patients because it helps for the developing erythropoiesis. Now, steroids, as we have studied, are the first choice. We have two choices, to start oral or to start IV. So, generally, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, you start with the oral drugs at 2 mg per kg per day, and we go ahead till four weeks. But if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we give IV methylprednisolone. Here, you, the point to look and remember over here is that you do not use pulse therapy of 30 mg per kg. You use very minimal doses, that is 2 mg per kg, every six to eight hourly, only for three days. The point to remember is that these steroids are very much effective for IgG antibodies rather than IgM because these the mechanism of steroid is that it reduces the FC gamma mediated clearance of the RBCs in the spleen. So this function becomes active within 24 to 48 hours. So therefore, you see a response rate of up to 80%, which is apparent within 24 to 74, 72 hours. After this time period, you continue for a, uh, for a month, as I've already told, followed by slow tapering over six months. We do not do a very rapid tapering or an abrupt dis discontinuation because it can cause relapse. Alternate day uh, single dosing is preferred. IVIG is an adjunctive therapy, which is only indicated when the child comes in a very acute hemodynamically unstable condition and has a poor response to the steroids. So what do we mean by poor response? It means that despite... 48 hours of the steroids, the patient is requiring multiple transfusions and the ongoing hemolysis is there. Second indication can be if it can be given as a therapeutic trial when the DAT was negative, but the history and clinic laboratory data was suggestive. So after giving this therapeutic trial, the child may respond, pointing towards this diagnosis. The dose is one gram per kg for two to five days. Now, the two variables which are strongly associated with good outcome on IVIG therapy are the presence of hepatomegaly and low pretreatment hemoglobin. So, the effectiveness is about 40% against the steroids, which had 80% effectivity. Now, the plasma exchange is also indicated in very seldom scenarios where there is no response to steroids and IVIG both. It removes about, it, uh, the mechanism is that it removes about 65% of the circulatory autoantibodies. This is done daily till the patient becomes hemodynamically stable. So this is a simple flowchart which will help you to remember this management. The first question once you have diagnosed warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is to ask whether the child is hemodynamically stable or unstable. If he's stable, go ahead with the oral prednisolone. If he's unstable, give blood transfusion and IV methylprednisolone for three days followed by oral steroids. Now, these steroids are given for three days and then we look for any, uh, we look for the uh, remission. If there is no remission, then you should consider some other diagnosis or if you are very sure that this is immune mediated, then start with the second line therapy. Then continue for four, uh, one week further and at four weeks, again, look for the response. If there is partial response, continue further for two weeks. If there is a relapse, then escalate to the second line treatment. And if there is complete, uh, complete remission, that means you have, the patient has reached the normal hemoglobin levels, you start the slow tapering for the six months. And at the end of six months, again, have a look. If, there is con if still the remission is complete, then you stop the therapy. If there is a relapse, then go back to the previous dosage. And if the patient is in partial relapse, then you have to look at what dose of steroids are needed for the patient to be in control. Now, if this dose is more than 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg, then you go ahead to the second line of therapy. But if it is less than this, then you can continue with this dose. 
So as we can see, we have already seen in the previous chart, the second line therapy is only indicated when there is no response to the first line therapy by four weeks, or if there is a steroid dependence of more than 0.2 mg per kg per day. So the choices are rituximab and splenectomy. Rituximab is preferred because of its safety profile. It is very effective. It brings remission in within three weeks. And this remission is sustained also for one to two years. The doses are four doses are needed, weekly doses of 375 milligram per meter square. The third line agents are the immunosuppressive agents. We have this whole cluster of drugs out of which the mTOR inhibitors, that is the serolimus, is the drug of choice. We should uh, note that there are no formal studies or uh, any randomized control trials done for this third line therapy. And this third line therapy is also very toxic. It causes bone marrow suppression, causes sterility and may cause malignancies. Splenectomy is effective in about 60 to 85% of cases and IgG antibodies respond better because they are cleared in the spleen. Now coming to the second type, that is a coal agglutinin disease. So here also there are of two types, primary, secondary. The secondary ones are commonly associated with infections. Most common is a mycoplasma and EBV. The other viruses are influenza, rubella, CMV. It is also associated with lymphoproliferative disorders mediated by the eye antigen. So what we should remember is that not every patient who develops coal agglutinins after the infection is going to develop this clinical hemolysis. And if the ones who develop, they develop it after two weeks of onset. And gradually as the infection clears up, this hemolysis also decreases and the patient is completely okay within eight to 10 weeks. So what is the pathophysiology? As we have already seen in the previous slides, it is IgM mediated type. This is a cold antibody which reacts at four degree Celsius. So, and the second thing to note is that this, uh, the structure of IgM is a pentameric structure. So because of this large molecule, it binds to the complements very nicely. So what we can see in the diagram is that the RBCs, they are coated with this IgM antibodies. They bind to this RBCs and then they attach this to the C1Q. Now the C1Q further initiates a complete cascade and the cascade is continued up to the formation of the membrane attack complex, leading to the lysis of the RBCs within the vasculature, that is intravascular hemolysis. Now in some of the cases, this uh, may be limited to the C3B level and these C3B coated RBCs, they get cleared in the liver cells. And the ones which survive, these are the ones which are detected by your direct antiglobulin test, which become positive for C3D. So you, the take-home is that the coal agglutinin disease has major intravascular hemolysis and it is IgM type. The clinical findings are similar of anemia and jaundice. The, the new things to remember are that the patient may have dark colored urine because of intravascular hemolysis. He may have acrocinosis, that is the distal part of the body like fingers, toes and ear lobes may be dark colored. And they, this darkness, this dark blue coloration disappears upon warming. So this is because of the RBC agglutination. The secondary uh, cast can be associated with the signs of primary infections like cough and mycoplasma pneumonia and transaminitis and EBV infections. So average profile, the first one is just the same, just the uh, on the urine. So, automated counts, we have same profile as in the previous one. The peripheral sneak does not show that much of spherocytes. It is rarely seen as compared to the warm type. So, what we see is we see RBC agglutination and rule formation. So, why does it happen? Because as I have already told the IgM was such a big, large molecule. It attaches to numerous RBCs at a time and they, they clump together. So, this is a peripheral smear picture which is showing the clumping of the RBCs. The DAC is going to be positive only for the C3D and it is going to be negative for the IgG. Once the DAC is positive for C3D, we should go ahead with the DAC. It is positive. The urine analysis using a dipstick is going to be positive for hemoglobin. Your KFT can be deranged and your serology may be positive for EBV or mycoplasma. Now coming to the treatment of cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it is very simple. It is because this disorder is self-limited, very short duration, so mainly supportive treatment is needed. Adequate hydration and diuresis is going to uh, assist in the hemoglobin renal excretion. So the main support you have to give is that keep the patient warm at the room temperature, keep the room also warm. Avoid any kind of cold exposure. If there is underlying infection, treat it. Some beneficial role of macrolides have been found in mycoplasma infection. Now, what treatment options do we have? 
Number one, packed RBC transfusion is indicated in the life-threatening scenarios. So what special precaution you have to take over here is that keep a blood warming device when you are transfusing the patient because if you do not keep the blood warm during transfusion, the, the IgM antibodies in the patient are going to, uh, they can be a transfusion reaction to the donor RBCs. The second option are the plasma pheresis. It's very effective in acute settings. It can be combined with the rituximab. The response rate to rituximab is about 45 to 60%. And in many scenarios, people use it as a first choice for the cold type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Now, the point to remember is that steroids have no role, immunosuppressive drugs have no role in this cold type of, uh, immune, uh, cold type of hemolytic anemia because of the poor response rate. Splenectomy is also not beneficial because the major hemolysis is happening intravascular. Now, some patients have mixed type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So these patients should be treated as warm type. Now coming to the third type, that is your paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. This is mediated by the donut Landsteiner antibody, which is IgG type of antibody, but it is different from the warm type because it is a biphasic hemolysin. This disorder is commonly seen in children before their fifth birthday. It's more common in males. They generally have a history of common URTI. So it is again of two types, primary and secondary. The secondary are after viral illnesses or can be after bacterial illnesses. So the pathophysiology of this type is quite different from the previous two because the previous two are purely ex extra corpuscular defect. However, this has some intra corpuscular defect. So what happens, there is a PIGA gene. The mutation in this gene causes deficiency of the GPI anchor, complement regulatory proteins which are found on the RBC membranes. So these are CD50. And CD59. So, what is the role of these, uh, these regulators? They inhibit the physiological complement mediated lysis. So, when there is their deficiency of these uh, regulators, there is increased sensitivity of the patient's RBC to the physiological complement mediated lysis. There is a formation of membrane attack complex on the RBC membrane, and there is intravascular hemolysis. So, the take home is that. This is an intracorpuscular defect. It is IgG mediated through a biphasic type IgG. Is, it is there and majorly it is intravascular. So now the second question arises that how are these antibody forms? So whenever there are certain infections, they trigger this antibody formation against the P antigen on the RBC surface. After the infection, that is about two weeks later, these autoantibodies, they bind to the P antigen on the RBC in cold temperature. Now, once the temperature rises, these bound antibodies, they further amplify the complement system and they lyse the RBCs, leading to intravascular hemolysis and hemoglobinuria. So here you can see that you need two temperatures. The binding to the membrane and fixing of the complement happens at cold temperature and the complement activation happens when the it is rewarmed. So whenever a patient lives at very cold temperature and has this susceptibility, this genetic susceptibility, so in his extremities, which are comparatively colder, the antibodies bind. And when these RBCs travel to the core of the body, then they cause the intravascular hemolysis. The clinical features can be same, just like anemia, jaundice. But the different feature is that they have intermittent episodes of dark urine, especially in the morning. Now, this can happen after every few weeks. Secondly, this hemolysis is usually self-limiting, but in some cases you can have severe leading to acute renal failure. Some other features like constitutional features like fever, chills, back, leg, and abdominal pain may also be present. Now, if the child gives a history that his symptoms, they begin after exposure to cold, like playing in the snow or drinking cold beverages, then this is a hit on the diagnosis. Some another specific clinical features of PCH are venous thrombosis in unusual locations like hepatic veins, mesenteric and sagittal veins, defective hematopoiesis with macrocytosis and pancytopenia. And in 3% of cases, it can evolve into leukemia. So to remember is that it should be considered in every child who has an unexplained cytopenia or thrombosis. The evaluation is the same for any intravascular hemolysis. There's going to be free hemoglobin in the urine. The difference is in the peripheral smear. It is going to show spherocytosis in less percentage, in less amount as compared to the warm type. There will be polychromasia, and the classic finding is that there will be neutrophil erythrophagocytosis. So on the smear, you can see that these are the neutrophils who have engulfed the RBCs. So this is pathognomic for this uh, disorder. 
now when you do the dat essay you, you may find completely negative picture or sometimes it may be positive for c3 so to remember is that this igg does not give positivity on the dat conventional dat which is performed at 37 degree as against the warm type which becomes positive why is it not positive because this requires colder temperature to bind to the rbc so that is why it is negative for igg so any patient you are suspecting of uh, having autoimmune hemolytic anemia and iv hemolysis you should always search for donut lansteiner antibody now what how do you how do we test for this donut lansteiner antibody whenever your dat is negative and you are strongly suspecting you take the patient sample the blood is maintained at 37 degrees celsius after the collection and it is poured into three different test tubes one test tube as we can see on the right hand side is maintained at 0 degrees celsius for 90 minutes the second at 37 degrees celsius for 90 minutes and the third we first give cold temperature of 0 degrees celsius for 30 minutes and then warm temperature for 60 minutes so when you finally observe them there is no hemolysis when it is maintained at colder temperature there is no hemolysis when it is maintained at warmer temperature the hemolysis only happens in the third scenario where you give the biphasic temperature range now this can be uh, complemented with control panels of control serum and mixed serum as well now the treatment considerations are the, this also has a very good prognosis you only need to give a supportive treatment like uh, keeping the patient warm the womb warm the the room avoidance of any cold exposure and good hydration we had we see transfusions are indicated in severe hemolysis and uh, decompensated state and here also you are administering the parabens because this is a cold immunoglobulin to begin so you should give it through blood warming device what are the other? generally it does not require treatment with steroids but it is the uh, it is beneficial and it's not a mistake that if you start a regimen similar to the warm that is starting with steroids and once the diagnosis is established you can stop the treatment the main the main modalities are plasma pheresis it is effective rituximab is the second line of choice and the third line are eculizumab eculizumab which is anti c5 therefore the membrane attack complex is not going to be formed and bortezomab bmt can be opted in selected cases who have a matched sibling donor so this is the same study at gangaram which found that this proportion of the uh, immune hemolytic anemia was a bit different which is reported in the international literature they found the cold type to be the most the most common one that is about 35% followed by the warm type and then pch was seen in only 4% the treatment modalities were the, the patients responded to steroids in 66% of cases and only 12% required any second line therapy the largest series till date from india of 50 children the prognosis of the primary autoimmune hemolytic anemia is good however the uh, secondary autoimmune hemolytic anemia have a very guarded prognosis the cold reactive antibodies they have a better clinical outcome than warm because they are self limiting the mortality is low it is seen in only 10% of cases the good prognostic markers are the age range of 2 to 12 years so infancy and adolescent age groups are poor prognostic markers coming to the key messages you should always keep a clinical suspicion of autoimmune hemolytic anemia whenever a patient comes with a new onset hemolytic anemia and you should go ahead with a direct antiglobulin test now autoimmune hemolytic anemia it is a rare disease in children which presents with variable severity these auto antibodies are directed against the antigen on the rbc surface and they cause a premature destruction of the cells the warm reactive igg antibodies are the most common they react with the rbcs and in at 37 degrees celsius and induce phagocytosis by the splenic macrophages this is extra vascular whenever you have atypical features or other associated cytopenias it is it is a sign of mark it is a marker of underlying immunodeficiencies or immune dysregulation syndromes like alps now screening therefore it is always recommended at presentation only before initiating the treatment you should screen all the patients of autoimmune warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias for these above disorders post infectious we have cold reactive antibodies 
these cause hemolysis following exposure to cold temperatures in the patient. Now, they can be of two type, IgG type in uh, gas and IgG type in PCH. They are active at 4 degrees Celsius. So, they induce intravascular hemolysis after complement activation. Direct antiglobulin test is the gold standard for diagnosis. It detects IgG along with C3D. It may be negative in 10% of cases where you need certain measures and superior tests. The treatment of warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is prompt, in, prompt initiation of steroids and transfusion if necessary. And the early the treatment, the good is the outcome. The treatment of cold agglutinin disease is keeping the patient warm and he may be requiring plasma exchange with or without reduction. The treatment of paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria is again keeping the patient warm along with steroids. So this is just the slide to emphasize as I had already taught. This is a suggested reading. I have taken um, the guidelines are from the international uh, red cell group of pediatric hematolo hematology oncology Italian association. Ma'am, do I have time? May I uh, go ahead with the scenario or leave I it? I think we are short of time today. Okay, okay ma'am. If you could okay. like, thank you for the patient. Do it in two, two minutes. How much time will it take? Okay, ma'am. Yeah, it is not going to take long. Okay. So it is uh, a boy, a 12 years old boy was referred to our clinic for a second opinion. He was in a follow-up for, for a last previous year at his local center for anemia and splenomania. At the time of his initial presentation, he had anemia, he had fatigue, he had jaundice and splenomegary, huge, massive of 10 centimeters. So what all possibilities are we going to think? So we can think about at 12 years, chronic liver disease, hemolytic anemia, extra hepatic portal venous obstruction and malignancy. So when we went ahead with his laboratory profile, he had anemia, he had reticulocytosis, his peripheral smear showed polychromasia and spherocytes. His markers of hemolysis were increased, but his DAT was negative. The second line test were because we found the spherocytes, we did osmotic fragility test that was negative. We went down to low CD, the liver ecotexture was normal, phenomenia was 7 centimeters, there was no thrombosis in the veins. The CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis showed hepatosplenomegaly in several mesenteric lymph nodes. The lymph nodes pathology was showing benign reactive hyperplasia and no signs of any malignancy. Then the, in the next generation sequencing panel for the RBC membrane disorders, enzymopathies, congenital erythropoietic anemias were all negative. So because we nearly ruled out all, all of our first possibilities, so the patient diagnosis could not be made. So a year later, he again came back with compensated hemolysis of 12 hemoglobin and reticulocytes of 5.7%. His splenomegaly had increased. It was persisting 18 centimeters. So do we have some new possibilities or can we further evaluate the child? So initially, we had kept all these possibilities. So we thought that this could be some hemolytic anemia, which we have failed to diagnose. So we again went ahead with a repeat that it was again negative. For the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, instead of the donut lansteiner test, flow cytometry was done. That was also negative. Ultrasound Doppler was repeated. Again, it was insignificant. So how will you investigate further? So here comes the role of super -pooms. Now this, because the antibodies which are present may be of low affinity. So here's the sample of blood was sent to a referral testing laboratory where they detected a low affinity IgG when the RBCs were washed with a low ion strength solutions. So because he was having such a long course, so we suspected the secondary disease also. We went ahead with the ALPS screening, which was positive, and the gene panel was also positive. So what is the final diagnosis? This is a conventional that negative worm autoimmune hemolytic anemia with the secondary etiology of ALPS. So how did we manage the child? Because the hemolysis was fairly compensated, but because it had a secondary reason, so and the chances of relapses were common, so we started him on the drug of choice that is sirolimus. And after four months, there was a beautiful resolution of hemolysis. And after a year, there was no palpable splenomegaly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arisha. That was such a beautiful presentation. And uh, it really expanded our knowledge on autoimmune hemolysis.